Some of my listeners may blame me for making a mountain out of a molehill. They might say tea drinking is a matter of insignificant importance. To develop it into something of the highest thought that engages the human mind is altogether out of proportion. If we have to take up every little incident of life in this fashion, we will not have anything enjoyable free from perplexing and wearying thoughts. What has tea drinking, after all, to do with metaphysics of a most annoying sort? Tea is tea and cannot be anything else. When we are thirsty, we have a cup of it, and that is enough. What is the use of making a strange art out of it? Oriental people are too fussy. We of the West have no time for such trivialities. Now let me ask, is a funeral ceremony a more significant event than tea drinking? Has a wedding a more moral or metaphysical meaning than tea drinking? From the point of view of God's isness, or a flea's isness, death is what inevitably follows from birth. There is nothing ominous about it, so with marriage. Why then do we make so much of it? If we wanted to, it could be reduced easily to the level of eating a morning meal or going to one's business office. We turn it into a grand ceremony because we just want it so. When we think life is too monotonous, we break it into several occasions and get sometimes excited, sometimes depressed. We all like vicissitudes and mutations. When a universe comes to an end, a Zen monk asks, Does this go with it? One master replied, Yes, while another one said, No. Which is in the right? Both are right, Zen would declare, and so declaring it will go its own way, celebrating or lamenting its ending, or nonchalantly disregarding states of becoming. As far as life itself is concerned, time and space are not of much consequence, though they are the mediums whereby life expresses itself from our human point of view. Our senses and intellect are so constructed as to interpret objectivity along the line of space and time. For this reason, we are really interested in quantitative estimates. We think eternity is something beyond our sensuous measurements. But from the innerness of life, one minute or one second is just as long, just as important as one thousand years. The morning glory, lasting only a few hours of the summer morning, is of the same significance as the pine tree whose gnarled trunk defies wintry frost. The microscopic creatures are just as much manifestations of life as the elephant or the lion. In fact, they have more vitality, for even if all the other living forms vanish from the surface of the earth, the microbes will be found continuing their existence. Who would then deny that when I am sipping tea in my tea room, I am swallowing the whole universe with it, and that this very moment of my lifting the bowl to my lips is eternity itself transcending time and space? The art of tea really teaches us far more than the harmony of things, or keeping them free from contamination, or just sinking down into a state of contemplative tranquility. Now let us turn to study Rikyu and other tea men. It may not be inopportune to give here a very short sketch of the life of Sen no Rikyu. He is the founder of the art of tea as it is practiced in Japan today, and every tea master gets his or her certificate as qualified for the profession from the hands of Rikyu's descendants. The art of tea in these modern days may not transmit exactly the spirit that animated its earlier masters, and there may not be so much of Zen in it as in the day of Rikyu. This is perhaps inevitable. Sen no Rikyu was born in 1521 and died in 1591. He was the son of a well-to-do merchant in Sakai. Sakai, in Izumi province, was in that day a flourishing port for foreign trade, and it was among its wealthy merchants that the art of tea seems to have developed first. For them it was a form of recreation. As they were rich, they were owners of many fine pieces of earthenware, chiefly imported from Korea, China, and Southern Asia, which they used in connection with the art of tea. In all likelihood, the tea man's unusual penchant for rare objects of art thus started with the merchants of Sakai, 
who in this respect also reflected Ashikaga Yoshimasa's aestheticism. Later, I will give a few anecdotes from the history of the tea in which we find illustrated an extraordinary or inordinate attachment to tea utensils, as shown not only by tea men themselves, but by the feudal lords of all degrees. They were willing to pay exorbitant prices for rare bowls or tea caddies, and the owners of such wares were objects of genuine envy among the lords, merchants, and men of culture. Rikyu began to learn the art early in his life, and when he was about fifty, he was universally recognized as one of the most accomplished masters in the art. The Emperor Ogimachi gave him a special Buddhist name, by which he has been known ever since in history, that is, Rikyu. Oda Nobunaga was a great patron of the art, and specially favored Rikyu. After the death of Nobunaga, Rikyu came to be befriended by Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who followed Nobunaga and finally succeeded in consolidating his position as the most influential power, political as well as military, in the Japan of that day. Hideyoshi gave him three thousand koku of rice for his service to him as a tea master. Even in his various campaigns against his military opponents, Hideyoshi was accompanied by Rikyu. In those days of unrest, the tea was so much a favorite pastime with the feudal lords that they could not do without it even while occupied with military affairs. The tea party was frequently a political camouflage, and one can suspect the important political dealings transacted by the generals closeted in the four-and-a-half-mat room. Rikyu must have been a silent party to this. He was a man quite capable of the task. Rikyu studied Zen at Daitokuchi, one of the five mountains in Kyoto. He knew that the idea of wabi, which he espoused in the tea rite, was derived from Zen, and that without Zen training he could not capture the spirit of his art. While he was in actual life not a man of wabi, in sufficiency, but one endowed with material wealth, political power, and an unusual amount of artistic genius, he longed deep in his heart for a life of wabi. Circumstances, however, conspired otherwise. In spite of himself, he was more and more drawn into worldly entanglements, and in some unknown way he incurred the great displeasure of his despotic master. He was commanded by Hideyoshi to commit suicide. The reasons given out for this capital punishment were trivial, and we suspect that there must have been something much graver, perhaps political, going on beneath the surface. Rikyu was then over seventy. When he received the order, he retired to his room, made his last tea, quietly enjoyed it, and wrote his farewell words in both Chinese and Japanese. The Chinese verse, roughly translated, is Seventy years of life! Ha! And what a fuss! With this sacred sword of mine, both Buddhas and patriarchs I kill. The Japanese verse runs, I raise the sword, this sword of mine, long in my possession. The time is come at last, skyward I throw it up. This tragic death, closing a brilliant life devoted to the tea and the idealization of Wabi, took place on the twenty-eighth day of the second month, in the nineteenth year of Tensho, 1591. The following stories told of Rikyu, whether historical or fictional, are interesting, and they shed light on the character of the man. When Hideyoshi learned of the beautifully blooming morning glories at Rikyu's, he intimated his wish to see them. When, the next morning, Hideyoshi entered Rikyu's garden, there was not a single morning glory, not a shadow of one. He thought this was strange, but did not say anything about it. When he stepped into the tea-room, lo and behold, there was one solitary flowering morning glory. One day Hideyoshi, wishing to outwit Rikyu, brought out a gold basin filled with fresh water and a spray of plum-blossoms, and requested Rikyu to arrange it. Rikyu, without a moment's hesitation, took up the spray in his hands, and, scraping the blossoms, let them fall pell-mell into the basin. 
buds and full-blown flowers scattered against the gold presented a most beautiful sight. When, one day in the spring, Hideyoshi was entertained by Rikyu, he was shown to a small room, one mat and three-quarters wide, which is in modern measurement less than six feet square. As he was about to enter, he noticed some full-blown branches of drooping cherry blossoms hanging from a vase suspended from the ceiling. The flowers filled the room even up to the entrance opening. This pleased Hideyoshi very much, for in spite of his liking for the tea, he was secretly inclined towards luxurious extravagances. He stayed outside for a while admiring the gorgeous flowering cherry blossoms, which literally filled the room. When Rikyu was still an apprentice at the art of tea, his master told him to sweep the roji, the court attached to the tea room. The roji had already been swept clean by the master himself. When Rikyu came out, not a speck of dust was to be found, but he at once read the master's mind. Shaking a tree a little, he let a few leaves fall on the ground. This pleased the master. Rikyu had a mind extremely sensitive to beauty from the point of view of wabi or sabi. He detected the smallest thing that went against it. When Rikyu was invited to a first winter tea party somewhere, he was accompanied by his son-in-law. When they stepped into the court, they noticed the gate hung with an ancient-looking door. The son-in-law remarked that it savoured highly of sabi, but Rikyu smiled somewhat sarcastically. This is far from savouring of sabi, my son. It is, on the contrary, a most expensive piece of work. Look here closely. Such a door as this is not to be found in this vicinity. It must have come from a remote mountain temple far away from the human world. Think of the amount of labour to bring it here, for which the master must have paid dearly. If he had understood what genuine sabi is, he would have searched for a suitable door ready-made, or made to order among the neighbouring dealers, and would have had it pieced together with an old board found about his premises. Then the door fixed here would certainly savour of wabi. The taste shown before us is not a genuine one. It was thus the son-in-law was taught the art in a practical way. Rikyu attended a cha no yu given by his eldest son. When he stood in the roji, he said to the friend accompanying him, among these stepping stones there is one just a trifle higher than the rest. My son does not seem to have noticed it. This remark was overheard by his son, who said to himself, I have been thinking of it myself for some time. What a quick, intuitive mind is my father's. While the guests were taking a little rest after the first tea, Rikyu's son quietly slipped out to the roji, and digging a little underneath the stone in question, set it down to the proper level. To conceal the new work, he sprinkled fresh water around. Later, when Rikyu again went over the stepping stones on his way home, the alteration done with all the subtlety did not escape his eye, for he remarked, Well, well, my son Doan must have overheard my criticism, but how readily he took it to his heart and remedied it even before our departure. Rikyu was once invited to tea, accompanied by a few friends. They found the court filled with splendid kashi trees, and the passage covered with fallen leaves, and they felt as if they were walking on a mountain pass. How fine, Rikyu said. After a little reflection, however, he continued, I am afraid that the master will sweep the passage clean, as he has yet no idea about Sabi. Surely enough, when they went in again after the first service, they found that the leaves were all too completely swept up. Rikyu then explained to his friends how things were to be arranged on such occasions. Later, while instructing one of his pupils in the care of the roji, he quoted the following verse by Sagyo as expressing his notion of it. Leaves of the kashi trees, even before they were tinged, are all scattered along the path to the mountain monastery, along the path, lone and desolate. That rocks and mosses and lichens are among the chief features of Japanese gardening, especially of that connected with the tea room, is noteworthy, for they are suggestive of the Zen monk's life in the mountains, 
and of the principle of sabi which rules everything associated with the art of tea. The use of stones as they come from mountains, valleys, riverbeds, and other localities add a great deal to the atmosphere of solidity, solitude, and ancientness pervading the roji. The moss, in large variety, covering the rocks and the ground, creates a feeling of the mountainous region far away from the life of the city. This feeling is essential to the tea room, for the main object of the tea is to escape from commercialism and all that savors of it. That Rikyu was the authority on Wabi is shown in the following story. A tea man of Sakai owned a caddy of a special pattern entitled Unzan Katatsuki. As the ware was quite well known among the tea men and prized by them, the owner was naturally proud of it. One day he invited Rikyu to tea and used this caddy. But Rikyu did not seem to be very much concerned about it and left the house with no comments. The owner was upset over this and immediately broke it to pieces by striking it against the gotoku and sighed. What is the use of keeping these days an article not at all approved of by Rikyu? A friend of the owner's later collected the broken pieces of the caddy and glued them together carefully so as to restore the original pattern. The work was done with a great deal of skill, and he thought the mended caddy was, after all, not a poor specimen. He conceived the idea of inviting Rikyu to tea and using the caddy again to see what Rikyu would say about it. While the tea was being served, Rikyu's keen eye at once detected the same old caddy now pieced together. He said, Is this not the same caddy I saw elsewhere some time ago? When it is repaired like this, it has really turned into a piece of wabi. The friend was exceedingly pleased with the remark and returned the caddy to its former owner. After changing owners many times, this once broken and now perfectly pieced together katatsuki fell into the hands of a certain feudal lord, Koyoguku Anshi, one of the most famed tea men in Kyoto in those days, fancied it very much. A physician friend of his, learning of it, visited the lord, and apparently quite accidentally referred to the wish of Kyogoku Anshi to have the caddy. The lord was amused and jokingly said, if he is willing to pay two loads of gold for it, I may part with it. The physician took this seriously and reported the matter to Anshi, who said, If that is the case, I wish you would see to it that I have it for two loads of gold. When the Lord was notified of Anshi's readiness to pay the gold, he was thunderstruck and said, From the first I had no intention to part with it for whatever amount of money one might pay for it. This confused the matter. The physician, who voluntarily acted as a go-between, did not know what to do. There was much going back and forth between Anshi and the Lord. Each of the parties concerned, taking it up as affecting his sense of honor, assumed a stiffer attitude than ever toward the affair. All the tea men became interested in it and extended their good offices to smooth the complications. By means of great diplomacy, they finally succeeded in making the arrangement that two loads of gold would be paid to the Lord by the other party, not indeed as the price for the disputed treasure, but as a kind of relief fund for the poor and needy in the feudal estate of the Lord, and that the treasure itself would be a free gift from the Lord to Anchi. Two loads of gold were equivalent in the currency of the time to twelve thousand ryo, which must be in modern money hundreds of thousands of yen. Anchi was perfectly satisfied with the way the matter was settled, though this, no doubt, meant a great cut into his own exchequer. He was not, however, quite satisfied with the caddy itself, for he thought he could improve on the way it was patched. He consulted with Kobori Yenshu, another great tea master and authority of the time, as to replacing certain pieces. But Kobori Yenshu was a wiser critic and said, it was just because of those oddities that it appealed to Rikyu so much and became an object of reputation among the tea masters. You would do best to leave them exactly as they stand. In Japanese architecture, the alko, or tokonoma, performs a significant office in various ways. This recess, cut into the wall of a principal room, originally comes from Zen architecture, 
where it was meant for a sacred picture or statue. Nowadays, any kakemono may be found here, but the presence of a flower vase and a censer in the alcove still tells its former history. In any event, the flower vase is an essential feature of the tokonoma, and no tea room is complete without it. When Toyotomi Hideyoshi was engaged in besieging the Odawara castle commanded by Hojo, the latter offered a stubborn resistance, and some months passed without achieving much. Hideyoshi wanted to have tea parties by way of recreation for his generals, but there was no available flower vase for the room. He told Rikyu to get one. Rikyu thought of making one out of a stalk of bamboo. This was quite an original idea with him, for hitherto no vases of this kind had ever been devised and put into practical use. He visited the neighboring bamboo groves to find suitable material, which found he made into a vase himself. As the bamboo dried, it showed a crack, and this crack became the characteristic mark of the vase, and it has been known ever since as the Onjoji vase. The Onjoji is a historical Buddhist temple at Lake Biwa, and its bell has earned its reputation from having a crack in it. It was due to this coincidence that Rikyu's vase acquired its name. Rikyu's homely-looking bamboo vase became a sacred treasure among tea men, not only because of its artistic value, but because of its historical associations. When its envied owner was one Yehara Jisen, his friend Nomura Soji of Nagoya came up to Kyoto with the special object of viewing the vase. Jisen, however, refused and asked him to wait for a year. In the meantime, Jisen busied himself with constructing a new tea room in which no bamboo was used in any form. The vase in the tokonoma was the only bamboo in sight. Soji was then invited and shown the treasure in a most appropriate setting. When Soji's request to see it the year before had been refused, he was chagrined. But when he saw what was then in the mind of his friend, he felt grateful and fully appreciated his artistic attitude of reverence for Rikyu and his work. Fuyuki, a rich merchant of Fugagawa, Yedo, wished to acquire the vase for his own tea room. But Jisen would not part with it. Later, when Jisen found himself in adverse circumstances, he thought of Fuyuki, who was once willing to pay five hundred ryo for the bamboo vase. Jisen sent a messenger to Yedo with the message that Jisen would sell it now for fifty ryo less, that is, for four hundred and fifty ryo. Fuyuki sent his messenger back with no answer, but ordered his own messenger to follow Jisen's, carrying five hundred ryo instead of four hundred and fifty ryo. Fuyuki's messenger respectfully carried the vase back with him to Yedo. The idea was not to slight the value of such a treasure, but, apart from the commercial interests, to treat it with due respect. Then, still later in the 18th century, its ownership went to Lord Fumai, another feudal baron of the Tokugawa regime, who loved the tea cult and had very fine taste for sabi. When he was using the vase in his tea room to entertain his friends, his attendant noticed that water dripped from the crack, thus wetting the mat underneath. He asked the master if he would not have a kind of cylindrical receptacle made for it. Lord Fumai, however, said, The sabi of this bamboo vase consists in the very fact of this leakage. Kano Tanyu, a painter of the seventeenth century, is a name I believe to be very well known to lovers of Japanese art, and it may not be altogether inappropriate to introduce him in connection with the tea, as he was also greatly interested in it. He studied it under the instruction of Sotan, grandson of Rikyu, and a great advocate of Wabi, probably in this respect greater than Rikyu. Tanyu was still young, hardly over twenty years of age, when he began to visit Sotan. When he saw the blank screens fitted up in Sotan's newly built tea room, he had an irresistible desire to paint them with his own brush. But his tea master would not listen to the request, for he thought his young pupil was still not experienced enough to do the work. Tanyu did not press the idea that day. Some time later, 
he accidentally dropped into Sotan's new room. The master was absent. The screens still remained blank. He considered the opportunity the rarest one, as his former ambition asserted itself once more. In fact, he had been planning for some time what picture would be suitable to try his skill here. He took out the brushes and started at once with his work. It was to be the eight sage drinkers. As he proceeded, he grew ever more enthusiastic about it, and the picture was nearly finished when he heard somebody approaching. He felt that this must be the master himself. It would be quite awkward if he were caught in the act. He wanted to finish hurriedly. The steps became more and more distinct. What remained to be done now was the hands of one figure. He somehow finished them and left the room as Sotan stepped in. Sotan was surprised to see such a fine work from the brush of such a young artist, whose proficiency he had not thought very highly of before. However, as he examined the work closely, he found the hands of one figure wrongly attached, that is, the left hand to the right and the right one to the left. But he did not say much about it. The picture remains there as it was executed, even to the present day. Later, when Tanyu's reputation as the greatest painter of the day, the one favored by Ieyasu the shogun, spread far and wide throughout the country, his old picture with hands wrongly adjusted called out fresh interest among art lovers. Tanyu owned a katatsuki caddy known as Tanamura, an object of great admiration among tea men. He thought the world of it. When the great fire of Meireki in 1657 reduced Tanyu's house to ashes, he told one of his servants to carry the caddy away from destruction. But when the spread of the fire threatened his own life, the trusted servant threw away the precious treasure and ran off to save himself. After the fire, a goods carrier from Kyoto happened to discover it on the roadside. He picked it up and on his return to Kyoto, he sold it to an art dealer. The mayor, Makino Chigashige, heard of the find and bought it from the dealer when it proved on examination to be the Tanamura Katatsuki. Some time later, Shigashige invited Tanyu and treated him to tea. When he innocently referred to the caddy, Tanyu told him that he was unspeakably grieved over the loss and wished him not to make any further mention of it. Shigashige told his attendant to bring the article in question before the guest, remarking guilelessly, here is a Tanamura duplicate. Tanyu was indeed overjoyed, and did not know how to express his feelings. The mayor was gallant enough to part with it for the price he paid to the dealer, with the request that he would like to have twelve views of Mount Fuji painted by Tanyu to compensate his goodwill. Tanyu, of course, agreed. But it was a difficult proposition, and the painter had to spend much thought and skill upon the execution of the pictures, which when finished after great pains, proved to be among his masterpieces. <laughs>